Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on my show, I like to delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Today's episode is all about greenhouse gases, methane, global warming, and global cooling, and basically agriculture's impact on the planet. My guest today is Frank Mitlerner. He's a professor and an air quality specialist in cooperative extension in the Department of Animal Science at the University of California, Davis. He also is the director of the CLEAR Center, a brand new center at UC Davis focused on research and science communication at the nexus of animal agriculture and human and planet health. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you on the show. I have been following you on Twitter for some time now, and I saw you speak at a conference actually back in 2016, and again, just recently in January, and it's just really great to finally have you on the show. Yeah, I have to tell you, uh, the audience I had was just outstanding. Talking to dietitians, to nutrition scientists is so much fun. I'm so glad to hear that. It was a really productive conversation, and you brought such interesting points to the table. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show to share this out with my audience. You know, you're very active on Twitter. And I think you, you've you only been on for a year or so, right? Yeah, a little over a year. And, uh, you know, people ask me, why are you not on Twitter, Frank? And I thought at the time, you know, what in the world can I say in two or three sentences that's meaningful? <laughs> but, you know, I feel that I was really wrong, because uh, since then, I have learned that I can have a major impact there. And you know, there are now several million impressions a month, uh, every month, and I would have never had that outreach um, to people who are interested in my field without the social media platform. Absolutely. I love Twitter, and I love finding people like you. And then I find people who follow you that I would never have met if I wasn't following you. And yes, you have a really huge following and a very large impact on Twitter. Just for everybody listening, and you know, I always do towards the end, the social media handles and links and stuff. But might as well just say it now. You can follow Frank on Twitter at GHG Guru, so the greenhouse gas guru. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But first, I'd like to find out, I know you've been at UC Davis since 2002, and you don't have a California accent. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit about how you came to California uh, with this revolutionary position that you came into, and you know how one becomes the greenhouse gas guru, and this air quality specialist. (laughs) Okay, that's a long story. So first of all, my accent. So um, people always wonder where I'm from because uh, I've lived in different parts of the world for quite a while. And I'm a native from Germany. I lived there for 27 years and then I moved to Texas. And they ruined my accent over there, as you can imagine. (laughs) And uh, I stayed there for five years, did my PhD in Texas, and then moved from there to California And as you said, I'm there since 2002. In between all of these uh, main periods, I spend a lot of time in South American countries and Asian countries and African countries, pretty much all over the world, studying the impact livestock has on the environment and to find ways to reduce those impacts because unquestionably there are impacts and they can be significant. And so my research has always been on what's called livestock ecology, and that is the interplay between animal agriculture and the environment. On the one hand, livestock can have negative environmental impacts, such as greenhouse gases or or other pollutants. But then also, livestock can be affected by the environment. For example, heat stress, cold stress, exposure to certain pollutants and so on that affect the health and welfare of animals. So I study the interplay between animal agriculture, and the environment. Excellent. Yeah, I should clarify that you have your Master of Science degree in Animal Science and Agricultural Engineering from the University of Leipzig, Germany. And as you mentioned, you got your doctoral degree 
in animal science from Texas Tech University. So as a professor, I always like to ask my guests if they work with students, what the students are like these days. Um, When they come into your classes, do they have any sort of preconceived notions? Are they sort of a blank slate? Are they eager to learn? I'd love to hear a little bit about that. You know, it is surprising to many that here at UC Davis, we have the largest animal science department in the country. We have 1,500 undergraduate students. We have about 200 graduate students. And I have to tell you that it is invigorating to me, and I'm not exaggerating when I say that, to see what quality students we get, how motivated they are, how interested they are in everything food. So, and that's not just um, animal agriculture, but in general, anything food, dealing with how we grow food or being interested in how we grow food, how we process food, how we prepare it, how we should not waste it, the externalities around food, health, environmental, and so on. I find it invigorating to be with that many students who really have this interest in such an important area of life. To me, there are two really main societal sectors. I mean, strategic ones, the one providing health, the other one providing food and everything around it. And so working in this nexus between those areas is just uh, wonderful. And I see that excitement in my students. So I'm very, very encouraged to see the quality of students that we have today. They deeply care about food and everything that food does in a good sense, but also where we can improve. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And people can deeply care, but not actually get an education in it and really want to learn the science and look at the research. And that's necessary in order to make a difference moving forward. So it's really exciting. You know, what I enjoy the most is that when just following what's reported out there in public, People are under the impression that everything that we do these days in producing food is just wrong. The way that we grow nuts, the way that we grow uh, row crops, the way that we grow livestock for meat, eggs, and milk, all of that is wrong. And farmers oftentimes feel ostracized and victimized almost and discouraged in producing Mm. food. And this is really not where we should go. Wherever problems exist, we should work in, in solving those. But we should acknowledge how important the sector producing food for all of us is and work with those farmers hand in hand. And, you know, those students I teach, they have this strong conviction that this is something that they want to do and they want to assist in. And that to me is very important. Absolutely. Very important. And can I just say cooperative extension is like the best thing since sliced bread. I worked in the state extension office in Missouri when I was in graduate school and fell in love with extension and all of the extension specialists out there. I know I have some listening to my show, some regular listeners. Thank you for all the work you do. So let's now start talking about feeding the world without destroying the planet. I know in your presentation that I just recently saw, in you had some great visuals, which of course we can't share in the, in the podcast, but can you kind of just give us a top line introduction to set the stage for the rest of our conversation today about global warming potential of some of the main greenhouse gases and how they differ? Or maybe you have a better place that you want to start. And that's not the best first question. I don't know. Yeah, I think to frame the whole issue, I think we need to start with what the challenge is. The challenge that's ahead of us actually has a name. It's called the 2050 challenge. And what the 2050 challenge is, is a discussion of human population development globally and nationally, and what that does to our food supply. Let me expand. And then later I talk about the greenhouse gases. Perfect. So first, I just turned 50 a couple of months ago. And looking back, when I was a child, we had 3 billion people in the world, 3 billion. Today, we have 7.6 billion. And by the time I'm an old man, we will have 9.5 billion. So throughout my lifetime, and maybe yours, dear listener, (laughs) human population on this planet will have tripled. We'll have three times more people on our planet throughout our lifetimes. And I think everybody would agree that poses a massive challenge because the natural resources to feed these nine and a half billion people will be different by the time we're old compared to when we were young. 
And that naturally leads us to make ethical choices of how we feed a growing global demand for food of all kind without depleting our natural resources. So that's the so-called 2050 challenge. By the way, this 2050 challenge mainly applies to two major regions in the world, and that is South and Southeast Asia on the one hand, where human population will increase by 40% for zero. And it's Africa where human population will increase on average by 50%, five zero. But in many African countries, human population increase is actually such that it's greater than 100%, meaning every decade, human population in these countries doubles, Mm -hmm. doubles. And now you can imagine that if you have a doubling in human population with very meager agricultural productivities, then that leads to a perfect storm scenario. And this is the scenario we are trying to counteract. So now shift in gears. You asked about greenhouse gases. When you read the media, when you listen or watch uh, the media, you will hear that what we eat is a main contributor to a changing climate. You will hear that consumption of beef and dairy, of eggs and so forth, animal source foods in general, but particularly those from ruminant animals such as cattle and sheep and goats and so on, leads to increasing global temperatures. So it will take me a little while, a few minutes to explain what's fact and what's fiction around that. So let me first describe the so-called biogenic carbon cycle. I know that sounds like a mouthful, but it is very important. Mm -hmm. It all starts with the concept of photosynthesis. We all learned in school that plants, in order to grow, need CO2, carbon dioxide. They need sunlight and they need water, along with nutrients from fertilizers. So again, sunlight, CO2, water, and nutrients. And so Then these plants grow carbohydrates. They produce carbohydrates, and the most important one is cellulose. So cellulose, for example, in grasses and legumes that animals then eat. For example, sooner or later, a cow will come along and eat that grass, that grass that now contains cellulose. And that cellulose, of course, again, is carbon-containing. So the carbon that originally was in the air as atmospheric CO2 became cellulose and grass, the cow now eats that grass, and she will belch out a portion of that carbon in the form of methane. Hmm. Some additional methane will come off from her manure. So the carbon has now changed its form. It has changed it twice already, from CO2 to cellulose in the plants, and now it becomes methane in eructated gas, meaning belched out gas. Now comes something really important. This methane gas is very different from CO2. Why? Because methane gas, in contrast to CO2, has a very short lifespan of only 10 years. And after 10 years, that methane is converted back into CO2. CO2, by the way, has a lifespan of 1,000 years. And I will explain in a few minutes why that really matters. Okay? So, in other words, and let me recap that, You have carbon in the form of atmospheric CO2. During photosynthesis, it goes into plants. It's converted into cellulose and other carbohydrates. A ruminant animal comes along and eats that plant and then belches that carbon out in the form of methane. Ten years later, the methane containing carbon is converted into CO2 again. So now you will say, well, why is that a good thing? You know, didn't we just hear that methane is converted into CO2 and that CO2 is long-lived? Yes, it is, but... The resulting CO2 is not, and that's important, is not new CO2, it's not new carbon, it's not additional carbon, Mm. but it is recycled carbon, and it originated in the CO2 that was in the atmosphere originally. In other words, the so-called biogenic carbon cycle is a cycle in which carbon goes from the air to the plants, to the cows, to the air, to the plants, to the cows, and so on. It's a cycle. Mm. Now, this is drastically different from greenhouse gases associated with the main culprit of climate change, which is the use of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. What are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are things such as oil, coal, and gas. Fossil fuels are former plant and animal material that millions of years ago decayed, fossilized, and then it was stored in the ground for so long until about 70 years ago 
when we started to extract that fossil fuel, that oil, coal, and gas. We have taken it out of the ground, and we did what to it? We burned it. And that burned carbon is now in the atmosphere. And every time the sun hits those gas molecules, those carbon molecules, these molecules heat up and trap the heat. Now, this is not a cycle. This is a one-way street from down in the ground where those fossil fuels were to the atmosphere where they end up being once we burn them. So on the livestock side, as long as you do not add additional livestock numbers to our existing herds, then you are not adding, and that's very important, you're not adding new carbon to the atmosphere, meaning you're not adding additional methane to the atmosphere. And if you don't do that, you're not adding additional warming, meaning constant livestock herds do not add to additional warming. But any kind of fossil fuel-related carbon, every time we drive a car or cool our homes or so, that adds new carbon to the atmosphere because that carbon has a lifespan of a thousand years. So, in summary, methane is a short-lived climate pollutant. It has a lifespan of 10 years, and it's not just produced, for example, by cows or by swamps or by rice paddies or so. It's not just produced, but it's also destroyed by a process called oxidation. And the production and the destruction of methane are almost in balance, both nationally and globally. Mm -hmm. And this portion is always left out of the discussions. Mm. And this is why beef and dairy look so bad in the reporting that people see day in, day out. Remember, methane is not just produced, it's also destroyed. And the rates are almost the same. That recycling, right. So I've been in the sustainable nutrition space for quite a while, uh, even before it was called Sustainable Nutrition. I used to work for the Dairy Council. I worked for them for eight years. I did my master's research on growth hormones in cow's milk back in the early 90s. But why are we just recently hearing about the difference in methane versus fossil fuels and carbon sequestering and methane sinks? Why does this seem like a newer conversation? Well, I think one of the main reasons is that there has been a massive hype. And that hype was initiated by people with an interest in offering alternatives to beef, to dairy products, and so on. And in order to sell those alternatives, the people who sell those produce a narrative that is on the backs of beef and dairy production. So in other words, there are people selling, let's say, plant-based burgers who don't just say, I'm offering a plant-based burger alternative, but they are saying beef is the worst for the climate ever, and thus you need to change what you eat, stop eating beef, and instead eat our plant-based alternative. Mm. And then they use a calculation that only takes into consideration the production of methane and not the fact that the gas methane from ruminant livestock is destroyed at almost the same rate as it is uh, produced. Mm -hmm. And that is highly distorting the discussion. It's, in my opinion, irresponsible because it sends us onto a wrong path for solutions. Right. It suggests to the consumer, it suggests to everybody out there that what we have to worry about is what we eat. And once we do that, we can relax upon everything else because it is the beef, it's the dairy products and so on that have the major carbon footprint, everything else pales in comparison. That is irresponsible and it's incorrect. And it's not just something that you hear from me. You have been hearing that from the EPA and others for years. Right. They have quantified the impacts of livestock versus, let's say, fossil fuels. They have been very clear in their official emission inventories that fossil fuel consumption and production in this country amounts to 80%, 8-0 of all greenhouse gases versus livestock amounting to 3.9%. You find those numbers in the emission inventory for the United States by the Environmental Protection Agency. So these are numbers that I corroborate through research done here at UC Davis, but they have been known for a long time. It's just that for some reason, the microphone is currently in the hands of people 
with an agenda that is very anti animal agriculture. And I've been observing that for years now. Yes, you've had a very strong voice in this. Uh, so thank you. And you looked at all of the nitty gritty numbers and reports, livestock's long shadow, I believe it was the report, the FAO report several years ago that basically they had to recalculate their numbers because they had missed a piece of the puzzle, whether it was overlooked or trying to oversimplify things or, or whatever. But to your point, if we're not looking at the whole picture in a factual, realistic way, yes, then we're not going to go down the right paths towards solutions. And we all need to work together and innovation, technology, everything, all the tools at the table to work towards solutions. And so these hyped numbers or these hyped messages can be a bit of a red herring. And it sounds like from what you said as well, which I've thought about often with regard to plastic straws, they confer some moral license, which sounds like a horrible thing. But it is basically people thinking, oh, if I don't use plastic straws, or if I don't eat meat, or if I do these things, I'm doing my part, everything is good, kumbaya, but they might be missing the bigger picture with the fossil fuels. Yeah, this is the real dangerous part of it. Now, I understand people's motivation in doing something and doing something quickly. I mean, even on the personal side. And I do it myself. I drive an electric car, I have solar panels, and so I do things, but I'm fully aware of what those contributions will be overall. Even if all of us were to do those things, such as drive an electric car and so on and change what we eat and change our light bulbs and so forth. Composting and... Yeah, the cumulative effects of all of that would be minuscule compared to the urgent need for some of the mega polluters out there. And that's largely big oil. These are major fossil fuel companies. There are 30 of those that produce approximately 80% of everything we blow into the air. So... By and large, the discussion we hear is one that is a smokescreen put out by those mega polluters out there. Many of my colleagues and I have said this for a long time. Unfortunately, we have these distractors saying, no, no, it ain't so. It is those belching cows. Uh, I have news for you. It is not the belching cows. It's not that they don't contribute. They do, but at amounts that are drastically different from what these people portray. So, for example, the entire dairy sector in the United States contributes to 2% of all greenhouse gases in this country. And that's assessed using a life cycle assessment, meaning everything from cradle to grave. On the beef side, it's between 2 and 3%. So it's certainly not the order of magnitude that you hear tooted out there. Now, you mentioned the Livestock's Long Shadow Report, and I just want to say a few words to that. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Livestock's Long Shadow Report by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization was published back in 2006. It was a good effort because it was the first of its kind that looked into the impact livestock has on the environment. And these impacts can be large. So they looked at the global livestock sector and how much greenhouse gases, for example, are associated with global livestock. Again, this is not U.S., it's global. It's a global average. Right. Now, and they quantified that global average as 18%, one eight. So far, so good. I didn't quite agree with the number, but that was not the main problem with it. The main problem was that in the executive summary, they tried to put this 18% number into perspective. And they said in the executive summary of their report that the livestock sector produces 18% of all global greenhouse gases. And then they continued saying, and this is a larger share than transportation. Mm -hmm. So it was no one less but the FAO in Rome, the global lead agency for food and agriculture that said that livestock emits more greenhouse gases than all cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships in the world combined. <sighs> so I looked into this and I wrote a peer-reviewed paper and published it in 2009. It took me a while and I found that this comparison was utterly wrong. What was wrong about it? They used two different methodologies. On the livestock side, they used a comprehensive methodology called a life cycle assessment, where you look at really all contributions a sector has on the environment, including in the case of livestock, soil emissions, plant emissions, the emissions coming directly from animals, let's say belching or their manure. But it doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop at the farm gate. It continues because 
you take the products and you ship them to a processing plant or you ship them to a distributor. Eventually, they go from there to restaurants and or to your kitchen. And finally, somebody puts it in their mouths. The cradle to grave lifespan of this product, let's say a pound of beef or a gallon of milk or so, is assessed by the so-called life cycle assessment. And this is the proper way of doing it. And the FAO did this for livestock. But they didn't do the same thing for transportation. For transportation, they only looked at tailpipe emissions when driving these vehicles. They didn't look into what it takes to produce cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, roads, harbors, airports, and so on, but only the gases coming out of these tailpipes. And that was a drastic misrepresentation of one sector versus the other. I critiqued that and also publicly, and the authors of Livestock's Long Shadow agreed with my criticism. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, so good. I think that they had done the honorable thing of making an honest mistake. They acknowledged it. They published other papers since. Uh, now they say globally livestock emits 14.5% and they are no longer making these comparisons. But the horse had left the barn. Yeah. And those people who like these comparisons, who want animal agriculture to be depicted as, as bad or worse than all global transportation and so forth, they keep going back to this old study and keep ignoring that it has long been corrected. Right. And this is just incorrect. This is just wrong. Thank you for explaining all of the details because it is very important. And yes, honest mistake, the first of its kind. And, you know, I had said a few years ago, I didn't realize it was that long ago, 2006. Um, here we are in 2020. But thank goodness that it has been corrected. But as you said, that horse had left the barn. And that's, it's really hard to turn that boat around, you know, once that mistake has been made. Now, so you mentioned globally, I would like you to speak a little bit about developing countries versus the US, because I think that is confusing for people. Also, when they hear some of these numbers, sometimes they aren't seeing in the US, we do have very efficient production practices. And yes, we can always be better. We're always striving to be better. But how that might compare to developing countries, because again, you know, we can keep improving here in the US, but can we make a bigger impact by also improving developing countries and also some of the barriers, cultural and political barriers in doing that? So I'd love for you to speak to that. Yes, it's a little bit of a complex topic, but um, I know you don't shy away from that. So <laughs> at first, I just want to give you a little analogy. Okay, so imagine we were to talk about cars and not cows. If you look at the cars we drive today, the car you drive, the car I drive, that's way more fuel efficient than the cars your parents drove or your grandparents, correct? Yes. And I think you would agree that the cars we drive here are way more fuel efficient and therefore have much fewer emissions associated with them compared to cars in Cuba or cars in Ethiopia or cars in India. Now, I'm not pointing fingers here at other regions in the world. I'm just saying there are distinct differences across vehicle emissions around the world, simply because some cars are more modern, they are more fuel efficient, and more fuel efficient simply means they need less gas to drive from A to B than other cars that are less fuel efficient, and as a result, they produce less emissions. Now, why am I giving you that analogy? Because the same thing holds true for livestock. Mm -hmm. So, just like... A 1950 Chevy versus a 2020 Chevy have a drastically different fuel efficiency and emission profile associated with them. So do cars. In 1950, in the United States, we used to have 25 million dairy cows. 25 million. Today, we have 9 million, so much fewer cows. But with this much smaller herd of 9 versus 25, we are producing 60% more milk. So we went from 25 to 9 million cows, and we are producing 60% more milk, which has shrunk the carbon footprint of our herd by two-thirds. The same is true for most other developed countries in the world, where livestock herds have gone down over time, and that is a result of improved efficiencies in production. And efficiencies really means that we have learned to keep animals healthy and in a relatively high welfare state in order to optimize the amount of milk we get from them or meat or eggs or whatever it might be. So 
The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the global body looking at greenhouse gases across the world regions, they also looked at various regions in the world for livestock emissions. And what they found was that due to low efficiencies in developing countries, so that's third world countries and emerging countries, due to those low efficiencies, they produce between 70 to 80 percent, 70 to 80 percent of the livestock global emissions, meaning the vast majority of livestock-related greenhouse gases in the world come from regions that are in their earlier development stages. For example, I just told you we have 9 million dairy cows in the United States. Just for real reference, any idea how many horses we have here? Well, I kind of know from your presentation, it's more. <laughs> ah, okay. Okay, that's right. It's 9.5 million horses. You know, that just shows you how relatively small our dairy herd is. Mm -hmm. So we have 9 million dairy cows here. In India, a country, of course, having a larger human population, but in India, they have 300 million dairy animals. Wow. We have 9 million, they have 300 million. They could produce the same amount of milk they do today with a quarter of their herd. Wow. If they were to adopt some of the practices that we have learned making our livestock more efficient, for example, establishing a functioning veterinary system that allows you to vaccinate animals and deworm animals, treat sick animals, and so on. Mm -hmm. They could learn how to produce food or feed for those animals in a more efficient way to optimize what the animal's needs are to what the animals can produce product-wise. They could use better genetics. The genetic material of both plants and animals in a country like India are dismal right now. Mm. These animals produce marginal, very marginal amounts of animal source foods. And as a result, the herds in a country like India are enormously large. Let's just talk about China for a second. China almost consumes half of the world's meat. China produces half of the world's pigs, one billion per year. But what really confuses me is that of the one billion pigs they have, they have a mortality rate. It's called a pre-weaning mortality rate, meaning animals die before they're weaned from their mom. A pre-weaning mortality rate of 40%, four zero. Mm. That means in China, that has nothing to do with the current outbreak of the African swine fever. This was before then. In China, they are producing 1 billion pigs per year, and 400 million of those 1 billion pigs never make it to the market because they die before they even finished and going to the market, and they end up on some landfills. And that is a country like China that is actually highly developed compared to most African countries. Mm. So cumulatively, that means that if countries that are in the emerging phase and those in the developing phase have really large livestock herds, then that means it puts a black eye onto the global numbers for livestock. Now, and this is really important to understand, because those people who I call the distractors, those people who want to discourage the use of meat and milk and eggs to our consumers, they use global numbers right. instead of using numbers that are appropriate for our market, such as the US. And this is deliberate, and this is highly misleading. If you were to be asking, you know, what are emissions of a car today, then you wouldn't look at a global average of car emissions, but of course you would look at the market that's appropriate to you. Let's say in my case, I would look at the California market, maybe the US market, but certainly not the global vehicle market. That is absolutely inconsequential for me when I buy a car. I think we would both agree. Yes, thank you for explaining that. And I was having a similar conversation about because I'm, you know, I'm pro technology. As I said, I did my master's research in biotechnology and risk communication um, with regard to hormones in cow's milk. And I've seen, you know, the evolution of how that technology had some consumer pushback and is basically a tool that dairy farmers don't use today for the most part. And that scares me because I want farmers to have any tool that they feel is appropriate to improve production efficiency and you know, improve the environment. It's better for the environment. What really puzzles me is that 
people's view on technology is kind of schizophrenic in some way. <laughs> yeah. Let me explain. Mm -hmm. So when my father was 57, he had a heart attack. And then a few years later, he had a second one. And they put a pacemaker into him and a defibrillator into him. Every time that he had any problems with his heart, those instruments told via telemetry his doctor something was wrong. The doctor called him and said, you know, what are you doing right now? Uh, you know, you're at risk of having another episode or so. So we were so appreciative of this technology. Yeah. Later in life, he had an artificial hip. And of course, he was happy to be able to walk again and so forth. Technology, when it comes to health, is a beautiful thing. You know, those 300 students I teach in my animal science class are, of course, just a normal representation of the population. I ask them, when you wake up in the morning and you have a headache, a splitting headache, what do you do? And they say, I pop a pill. Mm -hmm. So if you want to prevent pregnancy because you're not at this stage of life, what do you do? And they say, I pop a pill or use some other contraception. If your father has a heart attack or some kind of other disease that requires technology, such as a defibrillator or a pacemaker, would you appreciate that technology being used? And they always say yes. Hmm. Technology, when it comes to our health, is highly appreciated. Nobody questions that. People use technology. Nobody will go to a dentist, which I, by the way, have to do in two hours, <laughs> and say, you know what, just bring it on. I don't want to use any kind of uh, anesthesia. <laughs> uh, I will just motor right through it, oh. right? Nobody would say that. <laughs> but for some bizarre reason, when it comes to food, people reject technology. And I don't understand that. As long as the technology that's being used is safe, and I can assure you, any technology used in this country is tested for safety in ways you wouldn't believe. Right. Because I'm doing some of technology work, some technology studies around livestock. And when the FDA is involved, the so-called Center for Veterinary Medicine, I can assure you the amount of attention they pay to ensure that everything that goes into our food supply chain is safe is unrivaled in the world. There's no other place in the world that has safer food than what we have here. Mm -hmm. So to me, it is a mystery that on the medical side, people are highly appreciative of technologies of all kind. But when it comes to food, it has to be as natural as possible. And technologies are just bad. I don't get it. Maybe you do. <laughs> Well, interestingly, uh, obviously, it's very complex. But when I did my master's research, and I learned about risk communication, I learned about locus of control, you know, and that's one factor, you know, people feel, okay, well, I can choose whether to pop that pill or have that pacemaker inserted or whatever. But those other people are making the choices about my food. But we had some conversations about this after your presentation back in January, where, you know, I feel like the conversation is very frustrating to the point where, you know, we're looking at almost an elitist view of our food supply when there are there's such food insecurity. And that's a whole topic for a whole other podcast episode. But getting back to the technology aspect, you know, because as scientists, we are so pro-technology, it's easy to think that we can just take our learnings and innovations and teach these developing countries how to improve. And certainly, there is a lot of that going on. But again, I would like you to kind of speak to, because this, this is the conversation I was having with another colleague that sort of blew my mind a little bit. Obviously, it's not that simple because of some cultural, political, and, and other barriers so is there anything you can add regarding that to help people understand, okay, great, the U.S. is doing very well, we're continuing to improve, but obviously we can make some huge improvements in developing countries, but it's not just about knowledge. So I give you one example. Great. In the United States, of course, we produce beef and we produce a lot of beef. In fact, we produce 18%, that's one eight, 18% of the world's beef. In the United States, we produce 18% of the world's beef with 8% of the world's cattle. And the same is true for all the other livestock species. We have incredibly efficient animals that are raised in ways that most experts would say are humane. Of course, there are exceptions. There are people that are outliers and that need to get out of agriculture. 
but the vast majority of farmers and ranchers is responsible and takes good care of their animals. Those that don't really need to leave, in my opinion. But the majority of people do take good care of their animals. Mm -hmm. Now, these efficiencies directly relate to environmental footprint. By producing way more than we did in the past, with much less input, we are drastically increasing the sustainability of our food supply chain. That's not only true for animal source foods, it's true for all foods we produce. Can we assist other parts of the world in achieving the same? Yes. And I do not advocate that we just cut and paste from what we do here to the rest of the world. But there are elements here that we know would work in other places. For example, it is routine here in the United States that a sheep or a cow receives a dewormer before going onto a pasture. Because if you don't do that, sooner or later, that animal will get endoparasites, parasites in its gut that will consume the majority of the nutrients this cow or this sheep consumes. Mm -hmm. And as a result, these animals can eat what they want, but they are not really gaining anything. They're not really producing anything because the nutrients go into some parasites. We know that a dewormer will stop that endoparasite, kill the endoparasite, and allow that cow to make best use of the nutrients she ingests. Hmm. Why would anybody have a beef with that? Right. To me, it is the most logical thing in the world that if you can keep animals safe and healthy, that you won't just assist this animal with respect to welfare and health, but you will also affect the environmental footprint of this animal. Because now, you need fewer cows, fewer sheep to produce the same amount of food as you would if you weren't treating this animal. The same is true for housing. If you implement improved housing for those animals, then you reduce environmental stress, such as heat stress, cold stress, and so on. And by doing so, by reducing that environmental stress, you will reduce the environmental footprint that these animals have. Who in their right mind would oppose that? Right. But some do because of political or cultural reasons? Well, when I talk about these things, I'm not talking to and with some extremists. I am not really interested in the fringe, uh, which are people who have a preconceived notion of let's get rid of livestock. Okay, Let me be very clear. We will not get rid of livestock. In fact, we will need more livestock products in the years to come. The question is not... How can we get rid of livestock or you know, how can we drastically change what we eat and so on? But the question will be, how can we satisfy the demand the population has, which by and large is animal source foods oriented? How can we maintain that with constant or decreasing environmental impacts? How can we do that? And the past has shown that we can do so in many ways. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in converting some people who have no interest in listening, who are interested in changing the way we produce food in a major way, and who as a result have shut the door to all of those people producing food, mm -hmm. and as a result, they will not be listened to. So that to me makes no sense. If you want to make change to something that you disagree with, do not just shout to the other person or at the other person. But try to seek a discussion yes. or a discourse that is respectful and articulate your opinion and listen to the other's opinion. I mean, really, really listen. Yes. And listen more than talk. Yes. Listen more than talk. I do this all the time. I am confronted day after day after day with people, many of whom really want to learn, mm -hmm. but also with people who feel that they're experts. And how they write and what they write tells me they are not, but they have very strong opinions. And especially on social media, where a lot of this is anonymous, they can shout. Yes, absolutely. And scream even worse. <laughs> and that to me is a terrible deterrent. I cannot deal with screaming people. No, we need more voices like yours on, on Twitter. So I'm glad to see more academics getting into that space because... We have to have the credible information out there so that when people who really do want to learn and to listen, go seeking that information, 
the credible information is there. So thank you for that. Twitter is like a drop in the bucket compared to like these global conversations that you have. I know that after the presentation that I saw you do, you went on to an international meeting and you know, you're, you're having some very important conversations in the space and productive conversations. And that's the whole goal. So starting to wrap up here, I guess I would just say it sounds like maybe we're splitting hairs if we talk about plants versus animals, which I never talk about plants versus animals. I talk about they can both coexist and they both have a place on our plate. I wrote a blog post about this that I'll put in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com if anybody is interested. What do you say about the recommendations from, say, like Eat Lancet to, you know, what we see on social media and traditional media about eating less meat or eating a plant based diet? Can we really eat our way out of climate change? Well, I did confront Eat Lancet uh, with this notion, with their notion that a eat reference diet would have a drastic impact on the environment and was told that their main thrust was really health-related and nutrition-related and not environmental. And that's really what I read when I saw their so-called figure six, which was a depiction of various diets from their eat reference diet versus the business as usual versus a pescatarian, flexitarian, vegetarian, and vegan diet. So I looked at the environmental impacts across these different diets for land use, water use, nitrogen, phosphorus, biodiversity impacts, and greenhouse gases. And to my surprise, their own assessment, their own analysis did not show differences across diets for most of those uh, environmental parameters. So I did see differences for biodiversity, but differences in the way that counters what they say, namely the vegan diet had the greatest, meaning the most negative impact on biodiversity. And the only impact that they showed to be negative with respect to animal source foods was the one on greenhouse gases. But in my opinion, they made a very significant mistake in the area of greenhouse gases by not taking into consideration that methane is not only produced, but also destroyed, as I described earlier today in our podcast. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, Elancet has no leg to stand on on the environmental claims that they have made. The nutritional and health discussion that they have is largely based on observational studies, and your listeners will have an opinion on the strength of inference uh, from these observational studies on, let's say, predictions of chronic disease. You know, can we really use observational studies to predict chronic disease in people? You know, if I ask you for what you ate last year, and you tell me that along with 100,000 other people, will this be a good enough tool to predict rates of cancer, obesity, diabetes, and so forth. I have my concerns, uh, and without being a nutritionist, I know the stats around it, and I'm quite concerned about that leading public policy recommendations. Yes, thank you for addressing that. I mentioned global cooling earlier, so I want to be sure that we explain that. That's a term that I had not used before that came up in the presentation, and, and methane sinks. So I know that we talked about the biogenic carbon cycle and how and why methane should be treated differently than these long-lived greenhouse gases. But could you address the global cooling specifically? Yeah. So I first will talk briefly about sinks. Okay. So when you look at, let's say, the emission inventory for the United States for greenhouse gases that's put out by the Environmental Protection Agency every year, you will find that there are not only sources of these gases, such as cars, trucks, trains, planes, and so on, and cows, but there are also sinks. And there are two sectors of society that are sinks, and that's agriculture and forestry, these two, because they both control soils and plants, and soils and plants take on CO2 from the atmosphere and store it. And that's called sequestration. The sequestration rate of these sectors is large, but not very well quantified yet. But it is anticipated for it to be very large. For example, the Environmental Protection Agency said that agriculture and forestry emit, meaning produce 550 million metric tons, 550 million metric tons of greenhouse gases. But they reduce 720 million metric tons. They produce 550, they reduce 720. 
meaning these two sectors are actually a net sink for greenhouse gases, mm -hmm. meaning they take out more carbon from the atmosphere than they put into the atmosphere. And that means that agriculture and forestry are actually a solution provider to our overall desire to cut greenhouse gases for unknown reasons. The people who are in this area, in this sphere, will only talk about emissions, meaning where these greenhouse gases are produced, and they leave out the fact that these two sectors are a significant sink. Mm. And that to me is very regrettable because mm. we need the farmers and we need the foresters in order to help us make immediate changes to our climate because a change in these practices and more efforts in the area of sequestration will drastically cut carbon emissions. Now, mm -hmm. you asked me for global cooling. So if you take methane, for example, uh, then what I said earlier about the biogenic carbon cycle by no means says that methane doesn't matter. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas that's almost 30 times more potent than CO2. There's no question once methane is in the atmosphere, it has high what we call radiative forcing. If you increase methane, meaning, for example, if you increase livestock herds or increase um, fracking or so, uh, activities that contribute to methane, then that has a very negative effect. If you keep methane sources constant, then it has no additional warming effect, as I said earlier. But if you manage to decrease methane, for example, by using technologies that reduce belching in cows or that reduce methane from the manure storage, the storage of the manure these animals produce, if you manage to reduce methane, then that leads to global cooling. Global cooling really means that you take methane out of the atmosphere and you allow more radiant heat that enters our atmosphere, our Earth's atmosphere from the sun, to radiate back into space. And thus, it allows heat from getting back out and not accumulate at the same rate it normally would in our atmosphere. And that leads to net cooling effect. Excellent. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I think for many people, it will be new information that not only is agriculture and specifically animal agriculture, but all agriculture not as harmful to the environment as they have been hearing, but that it can actually be a solution to improve global warming. Yeah. Allow me to say one more thing. And that is, uh, I think, a very encouraging story. About two years ago, the state of California decided that all agricultural and other stakeholders need to reduce methane. And the goal set by the legislature was to achieve a 40%, that's 4-0, a 40% methane reduction by the year 2030. So in only 10 years from now, 40% reduction. Our farmers were in disbelief when they heard this. And they thought, how in the world can we reduce our methane by 40%? Well, the state did something very smart, which was that instead of using the traditional cane approach, they decided to use the carrot approach instead. What do I mean? The cane approach would mean you use rules and regulations and fines in cases of people not responding, not abiding by the law. That approach was not used, but instead the state of California decided to incentivize the use of techniques and technologies to reduce methane. And the state of California partnered with the dairy and other industries to put technologies onto farms that reduces methane. Those technologies are anaerobic digesters, alternative manure management practices, and so on. They were adopted by many farmers. Many farmers have jumped onto this, have partnered with the state also financially to put these technologies into place. And what can I tell you? What shall I tell you? After two years, after the law passed, our agricultural sector and mainly the dairy sector, have achieved a 25% reduction already. Wow. So we are 25 of the 40% goal already. And that is an effect of the state working alongside the agricultural stakeholders to achieve a common goal. And I'm encouraged and I'm so pleased to see that happening rather than the traditional regulation and fine approach. So mm -hmm. we can see it does happen. And as I just told you, if you reduce methane, 
you induce global cooling, meaning our farmers have done just that. Through their action, they have helped to reduce negative impacts of fossil fuels. Absolutely wonderful story and example. Thank you for sharing that. As we're wrapping up, is there anything else you wanted to say on this topic? Well, please know that the nutrition and dietitian field is very, very important to me and my colleagues. It is very important that we share a subject matter expertise in various areas to better understand not just the nutritional impacts of food, and that's where you're the experts, but what the impacts of the externalities around food are. Food is a central part of all of our lives. And while we have different areas of expertise that we represent, it's heartening to see that when we work together, we get a better feel of what the negatives are, what the positives are, and that really leads to sustained improvements of our common goal, which is to produce nutritious and healthy and sustainable food to our people. And working together is uh, my ultimate goal. I feel like it's a very exciting time in the field of nutrition. And I just want to thank you so much for sharing all of this very important information with us today and for your amazing ability to bring stakeholders together to address the issues of air quality, agricultural efficiencies, and sustainability, and really truly have productive conversations. Thank you so much, Dr. Mittlarner. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated our discussion. My pleasure. And for everybody listening, as always, you can find more information and the resources that we may have touched on or that I might pull together after this discussion. And you can access those in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. As I mentioned, follow Dr. Mittlerner on Twitter at ghgguru. And I'll have some websites and other information from UC Davis uh, available for you and Dr. Mittlerner's blog as well. And as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke.